You are coming from church, you are hiding your Bible. What kind of lie? Hi guys, this is the Maker and Slim, and I welcome you to my YouTube channel. Well, you're not going to believe that I've also been guilty of what God's servant pointed out in this message. That's right, I've also eat my Bible while going to church. Well, I didn't know so much back then, but thank God for His grace and mercy. So, watch this video and be inspired. Cheers. You are coming from church, you are hiding your Bible. What kind of lie? <laughs> you are praying, somebody knocks at the door and say, what are you doing? I was just saying something. I was, I was talking to my wife. Oh! oh. <laughs> they knock. Nobody answers when they call you next time. Yeah, I was praying. My God, I was praying. That's my time of prayer. Amen. You have not denied my name. You know why God likes me? You can't make me cow when it comes to Jesus. No man on this earth Make me cow. Not yesterday, not two days ago. <laughs> Amen. No, no man. You better get openly identified. That's how to maintain an open door. You have kept my word. You have little strength, but you have kept my word. And you have not denied my name. Where are you coming from? Oh, yeah, I went to towards Ota. You don't know? I'm a bona fide winner, born bread, buttered winner. Amen. When God becomes your helper, no agent of death can dishelp you. From whom? To villages, to next country, country. I, Jesus man, in out. It's in my way. It's enough for me. It's enough for me. The man of Galilee. It's enough. For me. You better wake up. What are you looking for? That you put Jesus in your pocket. And you hold it like this. Oh, do you still go to church? Uh, once a while. Kilo day. Kilo one. Amen. 1990. A governor gave me an envelope. I said, I hope it's your money. 1990. 19 what? 90. I said, I hope it's your money. I don't need government money. He said, my honor. I said, my honor. Kingdom one. Who can give me today what God is giving me? You have a company, you can't play in your company. What kind of company are you having? Are you the owner? God will leave it to you. They are not all Christian. How did they get there? If they are not, lead them to Christ. Are you not a winner? Every genuine winner is a soul winner. Every genuine winner is a soul winner. Them. Every single security man in my premises is born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? Ah, you said this is tough. That's how to enjoy open doors. That's what it is, man. You have little strength, but keep my word. And never deny my name. One with God is an ever winning majority. Not a majority, ever winning. Ever winning majority. Ever winning. You are going to begin to see new things, though. Anybody that tries to shut a door against you, seven will open. At the short of one door, seven doors will open. Now, Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1 to 3. 
The anointing is one of the instruments God uses to enforce open doors, to open impossible doors to his people. Thus said the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaf gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Mm. Come and say the anointed. I'll go before him and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. Now watch. And I will give him the treasures of darkness, the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which called thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. Now, that's the, that's the, the enormous power that the anointing of the Holy Ghost carries. For example, as Jesus returns to the power of the Spirit in Luke 14, 14, his fame spread abroad. Anointing opens impossible doors. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Many of us sitting down here today You'll be having your names called in places you least imagine. The apostles were in hiding for the fear of the Jews. But when the Holy Ghost came on them, impossible doors began to open to them. Peter stood on the rock and 3,000 religious people turned their life to Jesus. One day, next day, 5,000. Ask chapter 5, verse 28, 28, they took over the whole Jerusalem. That's the door opening power in the anointing. God gave us this land, but He used the anointing to subdue the enemies there. Amen. <laughs> It shall come to pass in that day that the yoke of the wicked shall be, the body shall be taken from your shoulder and the yoke from your neck and the yoke shall be destroyed. The barriers on your way forward shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Can I hear your amen? amen? Get ready. As this oil comes on your head today, a new day dawns on your life. As this oil comes on your head today, a new day dawns on your life. Yeah. It shall be to every one of us the dawning of a new day. Yeah. Any devil that seeks to close a door at you, God will close it. You can't change level without changing your lifestyle. Proverbs 1, 23. Turn ye at my reproof and I will pour my spirit upon you. Young people, be careful. Today, sin has been redefined and justified. And so, you find anointing dry young people walking the streets just guessing. Guessing and goosing. Without a tourney, it's not your turn. There must be a genuine turning from the things that displease God to assess the next level anointing. My God. Luke chapter 5, verse 37 and 38. No man puts new wine into old wine bottles. <laughs> As the new wine will burst the bottles, and the wine will be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles and both are preserved. To move anybody forward beyond his quality of spiritual life is to destroy him. And God does not tempt anybody with evil. Clean up to step up. Clean up. If you must step up, clean up. Sir. Clean up. Clean up. If you must step up, clean up. If anybody wants to step up, clean up.
Next level anointing demands a thirst and a longing. Isaiah 44, verse 3 to 4. Isaiah, please, 44. Isaiah 44. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and flood upon the dry ground, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thy offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. Verse 5. Go to verse 5, please. One shall say, I am the Lord. Your life will become an attraction. And one shall call himself by the name of Jacob. And another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and so name himself by the name of Israel. That is the anointing decorates destinies that turn individuals to attraction to the world around them. Amen. Don't do what? My, my God, you, you need to know how many people are listening to our messages. Oh. Who are no believers? <laughs> My God, it's a, it's a crowd of people. Amen. <laughs> crowd of people. One top leader in this country is not a believer. He told one of his proteges, There's one man you must listen to if you want to keep your career alive. Bishop David O'Hid. And he has kept faith with it. It must be in this service now, the second service. Amen. <laughs> Your life becomes an attraction with new anointing. And that's you. Amen. No one shall remain a byword and a proverb in this church. Amen. As the Lord lives, God's glory on this church will reflect fully in your life. Amen. Nothing goes down in your life anymore. Amen. Your days of ups and downs are finally over. There is a story of this young man in a class. The same class with a bully. That bully appeared to be taller than others. So every day he comes to the class, he shouts on everybody. If you are going, he will cross your leg with his leg so you can fall down. Everybody was afraid of him. But there was a young man in the class who woke up one morning and upon taking his bath, he was standing before the mirror half naked and suddenly he noticed his muscles and he said to himself the fellow that bullies me in the class doesn't have more muscles than this so with that understanding he got back to the class ready for the bully that day you see, when you are intoxicated with knowledge, you get ready for any battle. As a matter of fact, you invite the devil if they burn you well, appear now. He was determined that day. And when the bully came again, he was ready for him. He attempted to cross his leg. He stood strong. Gave it to the bully. The back of the bully was on the ground that day. Everybody in the class was clapping. And that's what happens when you have testimony people clap for you when you fail people pity you but when you have testimony people clap for you from this moment you will not hear anybody say to you sorry again you'll be hearing everybody saying hooray <laughs> if that is for you beginning from this week say loud amen Say with me, I carry the supernatural. For your information, if you fail now, it's a mistake. It's not in your nature to fail. No. Because the God you carry does not fail. If you fall, it's a mistake. You are not meant to fall. That's why scriptures make provision that the righteous may fall seven times. God will not count it against them. Anything that happens to you negatively now is a mistake while you are growing. God does not look at you with the eye of condemnation. He encourages you that you can still make it. He allows you to rise again so you can start your journey all over. 
The righteous may fall seven times, but the Lord shall raise him up again. Proverbs 24, verse 16. God is working on you. You will soon get there. I say you will soon get there. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. By redemption, I am seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers. Three quick things to look at here. Number one, you are in a seated position. The seated position is rulership position. You don't see kings run around. They are seated. The seated position is dominion position. If you've been in the palace, you see the king not only seated, but he is calm. It's a position of command. It's a position of rest. People ask me, you look so restful. And I tell them it's because I am seated. Your running elter skelter is enough. You need to get the understanding that you are meant to be seated. The Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy fools to sit thou. Sit. What makes others run around will no longer walk upon your life. Help me tell your neighbor you are seated. Uh -huh. You are seated. Seated. Number two, in heavenly places. You need to know where you are. You are not dealing with common elements around here. You are seated in heavenly places. In high places. I've never seen a general in the army arguing with a sergeant. No. No matter what happens, when a general is coming, the sergeant must push out his chest. Whether he likes him or not. Money, sir. And if the general likes, he can call you any name. Fucking stupid. Roll on the ground right now. Get to the gutter and start moving there now. He has the command. Say with me, I have the command. Say it again, I have the command. Many of us put ourselves in a position where we are arguing with demons. The highest place any devil can go, coming close to you, is underneath your feet. Underneath your feet. So when I hear somebody say, uh, Satan was speaking to me, I wonder, how did he climb to your soldier to be talking to you? You are in the heavenly places where Satan has been disbanded. He fought in heaven. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 8. They cast him down until there was no more place for him. And you are now in that heavenly places. You are from heaven. Say with me, I am from heaven. Jesus repeated that over and over again. John chapter 8, verse 23. I am from above. You are beneath. Chapter 17, verses 14 to 16. Saying the same thing. I am from above. You are from here. And he concluded in verse 18 of chapter 17. As the Father has sent me from above, so I have sent you. Somebody say with me, I am from above. I'm from above. Say it again, where are you from? I'm from you are from above. And not just above, but far above. Far about there is no basis for comparison. You are not near above, you are far above. The story of a man of God, great apostle of faith of blessed memory, Smith Hugosworth. In their days, there was no electricity, they used lamp. He was living in a sitting room, I mean, with a bedroom with a sitting room, and one night. He was hearing a noise from his sitting room. He was hearing somebody rocking his chair. And in curiosity, he came out with his lamp to find out who it was that was rocking his chair. And he discovered a very black object seated there. 
And what did he do? He blew the lamb. <sighs> Satan, I didn't know you were the one. And he went back inside. Not even saying, I bind you, Satan. Uh -uh. You, know, you, you see, when you ignore the devil, he knows the meaning. He knows the meaning. He went back to his bedroom. I don't know if you can see that devil, you can advise him, what did he do? He would reluctantly stand up and go away that this man, I was trying to get his attention, I couldn't get it. Listen to this. If the devil could kill him, he would not be looking for attention. He would have gone inside the room and kill him. Every time the devil threatens you that he will kill you, is because he cannot kill you. He's making noise to get your attention. Satan is a noise maker. He's not an actor. He's not an actor. He will use noise making to get your attention so he can get into action. He cannot act without your attention. So stop paying attention to the things you are hearing that are negative to the word of God. Stop paying attention. The devil that can kill you will not inform you that he wants to kill you. He will just go straight and kill you. If you dream that you had an accident on your journey, forget it. Forget it. Just declare in the name of Jesus, I go safely and I return safely. Don't give Satan any attention. He cannot harm you. He cannot hurt you. You are superior to him. You are seated in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 tells us that, and Ephesians chapter 1 verses 20 to 21 tells us how far above we are. Not near above, but far above. If you find a professor in a debate with primary one's puppy, the professor has a problem. If he speaks one, two grammar, the head of the child will scatter. <laughs> in the church, spirituality does not reduce materialism. Spirituality will multiply your material blessings. I'm a witness to that. I don't look for things, I look for God, yet I don't lack material things. Look at me here. Everything you see on me now, I don't know where they brought them from. For more than 25 years, I've not bought coat in my life. What am I doing? I'm pursuing after God. I don't know how much they sell shoes. Somebody told me sometimes ago he wanted to buy a shoe for me, a pair of shoes. He said only 12 people have it in this world. He called me back. He said, I changed my mind. I said, why? He said, because I'm not sure whether you use it. If I give it to you, you may give it to somebody else now. Because I don't know the price. I don't know the value. Somebody said he gave me a coat many years ago and was looking for when I would wear it. Suddenly he saw it on somebody's neck. <laughs> I don't have a problem. Everything habible is giveable. That's where I live my life. Everything inside wardrobe can go to anybody else. I can't see a fellow brother in the church not having shoes and I'll be pulling, comp no, putting my shoes together. No. I have not lacked anything even though I don't seek after anything. Spirituality will open the floodgate of material blessings to you. Engage in soul winning. And you see how God will be surprising you, supplying all of your need. Supplying all of your need. Supplying all of your need. Spend money for outreaches. And you see the inflow of God's blessing upon your life. Some of you seated there, you can buy bus for outreach. You can buy outreach equipment like I do. I don't think I bought less than six or seven buses for outreach for the church here and there. No. But ask me, when last did I buy a car for myself? And how did I get the cars? 
as I'm serving him, he's moving people to bless me. Say loud, amen. amen. I can spend 300,000 for telephone calls and SMS to new converts. Ask me how much credit do I buy for my personal phone? I can't remember whether I've ever bought anything more than 10,000, usually 5,000. Just put it there. How? Why don't I need to buy? It's getting filled. It's getting filled. I just hear, grand, what's happening? 10,000. Grand, 100,000. From where? Shout hallelujah. You have a car. You can't bring people to church in your car. That car is reduced to a can. It's no longer a car. It's now a can. So when next you enter your car, say, I've entered into a can. <laughs> Shout hallelujah. When you are in revival, your needs are supernaturally supplied. When a church is promoting soul winning, that church never lacks anything. I can tell you, that's why this church is getting blessed. If you watch it, we don't raise offering anyhow. Hey, there's somebody there. God said you will give 10 million. Yeah, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. Yes, that woman, stand up. I said, are you not afraid of the anointing? <laughs> it's not necessary. Just keep the revival on and people will be giving the way they ought to give. Keep the revival on. Keep winning souls. And the money needed for winning more souls will be supplied by God. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Stop pursuing money. Start pursuing God. And God will surprise you by supplying all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ. Do you know? I discovered nobody has capacity to meet his personal need. No. Because needs are enormous. You don't even know what you need. It is God who knows what you need. You know what you want, but you don't know what you need. That's why Paul said, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Stop trying to satisfy your needs. You don't have the capacity to do so. Watch it. Any man you meet on heart here always want more. And that's what has led many people to stealing. Steal government money, steal 10 billion, put it inside wardrobe. If there's more space in wardrobe, put it in that sock away. Put it everywhere. Money that you cannot openly spend. What a waste. What a waste. But if you seek after God, day by day, you'll be supplying all your need, including things that money cannot buy. Can you buy peace? Can you buy joy? Go to drunkards. All they want every day is to buy drink that will satisfy them. Yet, they are never satisfied. Go to people who go to harlots. They want to satisfy their cravings. Tomorrow, he will go back again until he becomes addicted to it. You are blessed. Amen. I say you are blessed. Amen. Raise your hand and pray. Lord, fire my spirit, man. Pour out your spirit upon me. In the name of Jesus. That is fruitful. Now hear this. Particularly when it comes to the fruit of the womb, please hear this. The original creator or the original source of man is not egg and sperm. It is the word of God. That's the original source. There was no egg and sperm that made Adam. That one was only a process put in place for continuity. The original man was created by the word. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything that was made. Made. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. The light shineth in darkness. The darkness cannot comprehend it. The original, original source of man was the word. Now hear this. Everything created that has life in it has its source in the word. God spoke to water and the water gave birth to fishes. So don't tell me that there is no... Hi guys, this is Emeka Anslim and I just want to thank you for always coming back and back again to my channel to watch my content. As you know, I'll never give you content that's not going to bless you. So let me know what you think about this video at the end of it. So watch and be blessed. Cheers. By this road. 
If you remember in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us that when the children of Israel came out and suddenly serpents invaded their camp and began to bite them and they were dying. And God said, make a rod that will, be, that will bear a serpent on it and lift it up. And anyone who looks upon that rod, whatever the serpent had beaten him with, the venom that entered will be neutralized. So that is the greater rod that swallows up all the rods of the magicians. It means that it doesn't matter what enchanters have done. It doesn't matter what diviners have done. It doesn't matter what babalawos have done. It doesn't matter what occultists may have done. No matter what has been infused into your body without your knowledge, when the rod of God enters, it swallows the rod of the magicians. He said the magicians did so by their enchantment. By their enchantment. They made their rods into serpents. There are some hearing my voice that there are serpentine movements inside your body. You can't explain it. Just things moving up and down, moving up and down. Strangers inside your body. But as the rod of God enters by the communion table today, every rod of the wicked shall be swallowed in the name of Jesus. So there is the rod of God. And that rod has the assignment of swallowing up the rod of the magicians. Now, what is it that makes the communion table the rod of God? Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. The Bible tells us there, look at this closely. And there shall come forth, what? A rod out of the stem of Jesse. And a branch shall grow from his roots. A rod. Who is the rod that is being spoken of here? Jesus. There shall come forth a rod. And when we partake of the communion table, what did Jesus say? This is my body. So that bread is the body of Jesus. That is the rod making entrance into your body. That means whatever strange rod was there, as the rod of God enters, he swallows it up in victory. This morning, by the rod of God on this table, whatever it is that is a stranger in your body shall be swallowed up in victory. Somebody believe it, say the loudest, amen. No wonder the Bible says in Psalm 110 and verse 2, it said, the Lord will send forth the rod of thy strength out of Zion. The rod of thy strength. Where are we gathered this morning? This is Zion. The rod of his strength is available here today. Whatever it is that is afflicting, tormenting, buffeting your body, by the rod of his strength, it shall be swallowed up in victory. In the name of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the flesh represents the miracle meal. The miracle meal. That is a New Testament manner that neutralizes all forms of poisons in our bodies and destroys all forms of weakness. It is a miracle meal. A New Testament manner that neutralizes all forms of poisons in our body and destroys all forms of weakness. Second Kings chapter 4 verse 39 to 41. The Bible gives us a picture there how that when one of the sons of the prophet went into the field to gather herbs, he said he found a wild vine and gathered from their gods a lap full and came and shred them into the pot of pottage that they were to, to eat. He said, because they, and because they knew them not. And when the food was poured out and they took it, the men cried out, Master, there is death in the pot. There is poison in the pot. And then Elisha said, bring me a meal. And they brought him the meal and he cast it into the pot. And he said, pour the food for them. And when they did, there was no more harm in the pot. It neutralized the poison. It neutralized the poison. 
whatever represents any poison inside anyone's body, by the communion today, that poison is neutralized. In the name of Jesus Christ, that poison is neutralized. Maybe you stepped over one satanic trap or the other and there has been an injection of a satanic poison into your body. By the communion table today, that poison is supernaturally neutralized. Somebody believe you say loud amen. I said somebody believe you say loud amen. In Psalm chapter 105 and verse 37, the Bible tells us there about the children of Israel who were feeding practically on manna the entire journey in the wilderness. He said he brought them further also with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Do you know what that means? Three million people moving. Not even that one was sick. Not one was even weak. Everyone was intact and strong. That means as they were moving from one place to the other, they didn't even have to wait for anybody. Everyone was full of agility, moving with energy. They were not moving on roads. They were moving in the desert, in the midst of the heat. Yet, no weakness. No, no one was depleted in strength because they were feeding on a heavenly meal. By the heavenly meal that we are partaking of today, not only will poisons be neutralized, but strength will be infused. In the name of Jesus Christ. How about the blood? What is in the blood? What is in the blood? Number one, the dominion nature of Christ that is immune to sickness and disease is in his blood. The dominion nature of Christ that is immune to sickness and to disease is in his blood. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, he said the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So when we look at the dominion nature of Christ, we find that nature inculcated inside the blood. So every time we are partaking of the blood, we are taking on a spiritual inculcation of Jesus' dominion nature. Jesus' dominion nature. And you know, it is nature that determines what your body can nurture. It is nature that determines what your body can nurture, what your body can accommodate. I was saying in WSF meeting yesterday, I said, you have never heard of a tree having malaria. No. Because the nature of the tree cannot accommodate it. It is outside its nature. The nature of Jesus is immune to sickness and disease. The Bible says concerning him, he said, a body has thou prepared for me. He was operating, yes, with a physical body, but it was an unbreakable body. Sickness could not penetrate it. There is no day you heard Peter, John, and James gather, and they began to go somewhere. They said, what was happening? We, are, we need to go and help or God get medicine. It's not feeling well. No, at every point in time, strong, agile, never down because of the nature in his body. Today, by the blood of Jesus that we are partaking of via this communion, that very nature that has dominion over sickness, dominion over disease, that nature is coming afresh upon you. In the name of fruitful. Now hear this. Particularly when it comes to the fruit of the womb, please hear this. The original creator or the original source of man is not egg and sperm. It is the word of God. That's the original source. There was no egg and sperm that made Adam. That one was only a process put in place for continuity. The original man was created by the word. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything that was made. Made. In him was life. And the life was the light of man. The light shineth in darkness. The darkness cannot comprehend it. The original, original source of man was the word. Now hear this. 
everything created that has life in it has its source in the world. God spoke to water and the water gave birth to fishes. So don't tell me that there is low sperm count. Even if what is in your body is water, if the word of God hits you, water will produce. Is somebody getting it this morning? So eat the word. Say with me, I will eat the word. Secondly, we discover that we share the same blood group with Christ through the mystery of the Holy Communion. We share the same blood group with Christ through the mystery of the Holy Communion. You know, in the physical, you can't transfuse blood to a person with whom there is no blood match. Is somebody getting it? They must check that the, the, the blood matches or else there's a crisis. So the fact that we have access to partaking of the blood of Jesus, it means that God has adjusted our blood group to match his own blood group. Is somebody getting what God is saying? He has adjusted it. So that communion, as we are partaking of it, there is a divine blood group adjustment. Aligning our blood group with the blood group of Christ. Is somebody getting it this morning? And that's what empowers us to have practical dominion. So the things that affect, afflict, and torment others can torment us. Men like John G. Nick understood these things. That's why he could go to where there was bubonic plague and then wipe the mouth of those who were foaming with that terrible virus that was so contagious that people had to be paid exorbitant amounts of money to bury the dead. That is, somebody dies, nobody wants to bury them. Out of fear of the plague. But here came a man wiping the, the, the thing off their mouth. And then they said, what's going on? They tested the things in his hand. Everything was dead. The things on the one who he just cleaned, everything was alive. How come you carried what was living and it died in your hand? How come? How come? And he refers to it as the spirit of life in Christ. That is what is quickened inside you and I by the communion table. As we partake of the communion table, there is a blood group adjustment that makes you and I operate at the frequency of Jesus. This morning, via this table, that blood group adjustment is taking place supernaturally. In the name of Jesus Christ. You believe me, say the loudest, amen. What is required of you and I is that we infuse our faith into the communion table. We infuse our faith. We heard in the first service, God's servant speaking. He said, it's not about one special bread, one special drink. No. It was from what they were eating, Jesus took. What makes the difference is when we pray over it and you infuse your faith. Your faith is what makes the difference. It's what determines your lot. This morning, as your faith is injected into this table, I see your miracle deliver support. <laughs> For years, I pastored in our church in the UK and I discovered something. Weekend work, pay is more than weekday. So it's like 1.25 or so of weekday. Because of that weekend pay, you will discover that people begin to budget their Sundays. Not that they must come to work, but they volunteer that that weekend they will take it. So Monday to Sunday they are working, then they will want to manage just shock one Sunday there, maybe per month, budgeting the Sunday on the, on the basis of money. And you discover that those who take that stand, they hardly go far. Until many began to awake, and from there began to go full force, and you see God lifting them and changing their story. Never negotiate your commitment to fellowship. That is one of the things that the devil will always seek to do. You know what Pharaoh said to Moses? He said, you can go to worship God, but don't go far. Don't go far. He said, you can go, but don't go with everybody. 
You can go, but don't go with your cattle. He wants to negotiate the level of our commitment. But my prayer is that for each one of us, that temptation comes to an end today. God is ushering you and I to new realms of victory. In the name to sing. I can't forget the testimony of a particular brother who stood on this altar some time ago. And he said that he went out preaching. And as he was doggedly out for Jesus, a particular man looked at him one day. And he said, get out of here, you one trousered preacher. He has been seeing him there wearing the same trouser every day. And he looked at him and insulted him like that. And he said, now I know that my own time has come. And before you knew it, a breakthrough that made him, you know, a high flyer, inexplainable, came his way. Because God uses revivers to terminate frustration. He uses revival. When he was sharing the testimony, it was a testimony that had valuations in billions. Trouser is not a problem anymore. Because God changed his story and made him the envy of his world. For somebody hearing my voice in this season, God will make you the envy of your world. When the move of God breaks loose, fortune begins to manifest. We're told in the first two services, the experience of the nation of South Korea. South Korea was an impoverished nation, one of the poorest nations in the world. But suddenly, as God began to move, with a minor population of about 400,000, God began to move in that nation. And before you knew it, within the short space of time, it became the number 13th industrialized nation in the world catapulted by the move of God as they kept pushing the kingdom God kept pushing the economy of the nation decorated it until today it has become what it is we have the United States of America that nation was founded on the fundamental desire to serve God the people went there because they were looking for a place where they could serve God in liberty till today if you look at the American dollar it has on it in God we trust it was the fundamental ethos of the nation. Serving God, pursuing God. One nation under God is how they refer to themselves. One nation under God. And as they began to pursue God, this is a nation that just started. They started in, 17, in 1776. And when they started as a nation, there was nothing existing. Just a colony of people that gathered in a place that they found. And the nation began to go from there and went from a non-existent nation to becoming the number one nation in the world because when god's move begin to spread in a place it catapults the nation to the top everything begins to move forward shout hallelujah now if that happens for nations how will it not happen for, for persons when individuals begin to go after god there is the release of heaven's resources in their direction that will become your testimony number two divine health is a lot of every engaging believer in a revival as you keep serving god god keeps refining your health perfecting your health shout hallelujah exodus chapter 23 verse 25 and 26 you shall serve the lord your god he will bless your bread and your water he will take sickness away from the midst of thee john 15 and verse 2 he said the branch that brings forth fruit he budget it that it may bring forth much more fruit so as we are serving god there is a cleansing of our bodies from whatever is tormenting or afflicting us from this day onward there shall be no more affliction in your body if you believe it say louder amen i said there shall be no more affliction in your body we have the testimony of one of our sisters who had cancer of the mouth. And according to her, she just kept going around serving God, advertising Jesus everywhere, telling everybody about Jesus. And one day in the night, suddenly she had a visitation. And, a, you know, an angelic personality came and took the tumor out of her mouth. That was the end of cancer. Cancer was canceled on the basis of her commitment to God. I don't know what anyone's condition here may be, but as you commit in your heart to serve God, every affliction is brought to a permanent end. In the name of Jesus Christ. 
Number three, every revival empowers believers to command the supernatural. It empowers believers to command the supernatural. It empowers believers to command the supernatural. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 18, And the children that the Lord has given unto me, we are for signs and for wonders. As we keep serving God, we are empowered for the supernatural. In Luke chapter 9, verse 1 to 6, as he sent them forth, he gave them power and authority over all devils. Everything was bowing to them because they were on the go for him. Every time we commit ourselves to advancing the kingdom of God, he empowers us to command the supernatural. Strange manifestations begin to occur as we get on the go for Jesus. In this season, we shall see the hand of God in an unusual dimension. If you believe it, say louder, amen. amen. I said, if you believe it, say louder, amen. amen. I said, in this season, we shall see the hand of God in a strange dimension. Amen. If you believe it, say louder, amen. amen. We shall see the hand of God in a strange dimension. Amen. If you believe it, say the loudest, amen. amen. So in the season of revival, we are empowered to begin to operate in new dimensions of the supernatural now today is our covenant day of healing and let's take note of this jesus specializes in healing all manner of sicknesses and diseases it doesn't matter what the case is there is no case that is ever referred from christ jesus is the final bus stop when your case meets him your case meets an answer and the good news is that today you have come to Jesus. That means that every case against your health is being overturned for a testimony today. Yeah. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. The Bible makes us understand that Jesus went about teaching and healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among the people. Everywhere he went, he kept touching, healing, setting free. We also saw that Jesus empowered his disciples to do the same. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1, he sent them out. And verse 8, he said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. He sent them and empowered them to do the same. Now, please take note that medical science has no solution to oppressions of the devil. There is no microscope that can see a devil. There is no blood test that can decipher a demon. It would take one coming to Christ to profess solutions where man has no answer it will take coming to christ there are many cases that many have spent and spent and spent and spent and yet there is nothing to show the woman with the issue of blood came to jesus she had for 12 years been trying to manage this issue of blood spent all her resources on physicians and the bible says she was not even made better rather she kept growing worse but she came in contact with Jesus and that was the end of that situation. I don't know what your situation may be today, but as you come in contact with Jesus this morning, that situation is coming to a permanent end. Yeah. If you believe it, say loud, amen. Yeah. I said, if you believe it, say loud, amen. Yeah. So even when medical science has no answer, Jesus has the answer. When it has no answer, Jesus has the answer. I remember the testimony of a particular woman. This woman was trusting for the fruit of the womb and they had done all manner of tests. Doctor looked at her and said, there is nothing wrong with you. To the point that she had gone to various nations and eventually they put a file for her and they called it an unexplained medical mystery. There was no way to explain why she could not get pregnant, yet she was not pregnant unexplained medical mystery that is everything they have learned about the human body could not explain why this woman was not pregnant but then she came to jesus here and jesus turned around the end unexplained medical mystery and gave her a physical miracle baby the mystery was cancelled i don't know what people cannot explain about your life but today by the encounter you are having with Jesus, your miracle shall be open for all to see. If you believe it, say loud, amen. In the first service, a brother came here and 
as the word and the anointing went forth, suddenly he looked at himself and discovered he had come with a kidney affliction. Legs were swollen up, pain in the kidney. But at the conclusion of that encounter, legs had come back to normal. Kidney pain had disappeared. Completely healed. A woman came here, I believe it was second service. She said that she came into the service aided by people. But by the time she came out, walking totally free because she had met with Jesus. There is somebody hearing my voice today that is going to meet with that same Jesus right now. And as you do, everything that is an affliction in your body is coming out in the name of Jesus. You believe it, say loud, amen. But Christ does not only heal the sick and deliver the captive, but he also raises the dead. So there's no close case with Jesus. He raises the dead. He raises the dead. We are told in the book of John chapter 5, verse 22 to 25, verse 25 in particular, he said the hour is coming and now is when the, so when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. They that hear shall live. So it doesn't matter what is dead in you. Today, by the word of God, whatever is dead comes back to life. In the name of for it, now see, the wine of yesterday cannot keep you intoxicated today. No matter how experienced a drunkard you are, <laughs> if you took some wine yesterday and it turns you on and turns you violent, and you don't take for the next one week, you become normal. <laughs> Come on now. So it's the wine you need on constant basis so you can stay on top on constant basis. You need this wine of the Holy Ghost and how do you gather? Now you see, thank God for prayers, we need that. Thank God for fasting, we need that. But one missing thing we need to know is ministering to the Lord. Entitles you to fresh oil. Mm -hmm. Ministering yeah. to the Lord. Yeah. Mm. Ministering to the Lord. The Bible said they prayed, fasted, and ministered unto, unto the Lord. And the Holy Ghost said. Now you see, every time you minister to the Lord in worship, you are connecting with the release of fresh oil. Mm. Now listen, Psalm 92 and verse 1. The Bible says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praise unto his name is the most high God. To tell of his love and kindness in the morning and his faithfulness every night. He said, then your horn shall be exalted like the horn of a unicorn. Verse 10, you shall be anointed with fresh oil. So ministering to the Lord provides you and I access to the fresh oil. Thank God for prayers, we are used to that. Thank God for fasting, we are used to that. But we need to know what ministering to the Lord does. It connects into the lease of fresh oil. Well, and you know the Bible says, let not your head lack ointment. Let your garment be always white. You must keep the oil on your life fresh. Yeah. And one way to do that is to learn the mystery of ministering to the Lord. Yes. Ministering to the Lord. Yes. And I mean, not just singing and jumping, but as you are ministering to him, you are speaking back to him, you know. I love you more than anything. I love you. Lord, I give my life to you. You are the reason I'm alive, Jesus. I just love you. There is no exchange for you in my life. I don't have no substitute for you. I love you, Jesus. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah, the man of war. His mercy endured forever and ever. I praise your holy name. And you worship him in spirit and in understanding. What happens? Fresh air comes on you. <laughs> Friends, now the truth is this. Jesus called me about 31 years ago. By his grace, I'm stronger today than I was the day he called me. I've not lost one ounce of spiritual energy. Neither have I lost one ounce of physical energy. There is access to fresh oil if we know what it takes. Thank God for prayers, thank God for fasting, but you don't really know the fresh oil until you learn how to minister to the Lord. It's time to get that done. It's time to get that done. 
It's time to get that done. We need to get that done. You need the fresh oil to stay intoxicated and to remain violent. So that at any time you are hit, the lion in you rises. Any time you are hit, the lion in you rises and then you are able to take charge. We have the Holy Ghost wine. Everybody needs to know that. That we can assess that and that fresh oil is available to every one of us. The violent man in you will come alive when the oil is fresh. The fresher the oil, the more violent you are. What more? We also know that the anointing empowers our access into the deep things of God, which is also highly intoxicating. Every true revelation intoxicates. I'll get the under now. Every true revelation intoxicates. Now, let's go to the next brand of wine, and that is the word wine, the word wine, W-O-R-D. Now, in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1, O oh, every man that tasted, come you to the waters. Come buy wine. Come buy milk without money and without cost. Now, verse 11 says, this speak he. I mean, it's, verse 11 said, so shall my word be, which is gone forth out of my lips. So the word has wine genes. Mm. There are wine genes in the world. Now you see, God's word is in different nutritional levels. There is the water of the world. There is the milk of the world. Somebody hearing what I'm saying? There is the meat of the world. And there is the strong meat of the world. Now, there is the honey of the world. And that is the wine of the world. Remember what he said. Come into the waters, so shall my word be. So there is the water realm of the world. Now, there is the milk realm. Come by milk. Desire the milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. So there is the milk of the world. And then we have the meat of the world. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. He said, the meat which has not profited them that are feed thereby. It's talking about doctrines. So, so there is the meat. Now Hebrews 5.14 talks about the strong meat. But strong meat belongs to them who by reason of use have exercised their senses. Like ALM will say, the strong man's gospel. The strong meat. Strong meat. There is the meat, there is the strong meat. When you win a child from milk, it starts on cereal. That is meat. Then after some time it begins to tear you know, chicken and all that stuff and fish, that's getting up to the strong meat level. And then you have the honey of the world. My son, eat thou honey, for it is good. That's the honey level. And then you have the wine level. Now, there is no way milk can intoxicate you. And meat cannot intoxicate you, whether strong meat or weak meat. Now, there is no way honey can intoxicate you. It has to be wine. So there is the wine of the world that intoxicates men unto violence. Is somebody here know what I'm talking about? There is the wine of the world. We need to get out of the shallow waters, man. We need to get out of the shallow waters and get to where the stuff is. Get to the real thing. There is the wine level. There are certain things I found, no matter what's happening in the world, I can't drop them because I'm under the intoxicating influence of those things. I can't drop them. So there is a wine level. And you see, Jesus talks about the word as the seed. Now, when you run water on grains, it goes through fermentation. Man, that's what they call brewing. Now, the Holy Ghost is the river. The word of God is the seed. So when the Holy Ghost runs on the seed, it brews it. Come on now. It brews it. With the Holy Ghost, teach it. Comparing the spiritual things with spiritual. By the time he mixes them together, you're off. Mm. Absolutely in command. Somebody's blessed here. Yes, we need access to the wine realm of the world. We need access to the wine. That's when you do as occasions have you. When you get there, you do as occasions. That's you are fully supernaturally in charge. Somebody's blessed here. Yes, well, it's a brand new day for us. Amen. Come on, shout glory. glory. Shout glory. 
Let's run quickly. What other wine do we have? We have the prayer wine. What do I call it? There is the prayer wine. You remember the story of Hannah? She was praying. Only her lips moved. Her voice was not heard. First Samuel chapter 1, verse 9 to 17. And Eli came and said, put your wine away from you. Come on, say with me, prayer wine. Prayer. That is the prayer wine. And uh, the Holy Ghost is also the facilitator of that wine. Because we don't know what we should pray as we ought to, but the Holy Ghost make an intention for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And because he knows the mind of God, he prays according to the will of God. So when the spirit of grace and supplication comes, then you come under the influence of the prayer wine. Prayer becomes a delight. You live under his influence perpetually. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? And when you come under the prayer wine, there is no way you will not get divine attention. Just like that woman, Hannah, got it. She was operating the wine realm of prayer. Only her lips moved, her voice was not heard. She wasn't trying to play fancy or grammar in prayers. She was pouring her soul to God. Her spirit person was reaching out to heaven. And God came down to answer her. There is a prayer wine and I pray that that anointing for prayers, the anointing that prays according to the will of God, that prays in the Holy Ghost, comes on everyone under this meeting tonight. There is the prayer wine. These are the wines that intoxicate people. Jesus came back from a prayer mountain and the Bible says a possessed person saw him and cried. Hey, have you come to church before the time? He was just coming under that influence of the prayer wine. The prayer wine was fresh. The prayer, no demon could stand on the way. The prayer wine was fresh. We need that. We need that to go places for Jesus. We need that. We need that. Praying in the Holy Ghost. We need that. It has a lot to offer us. As we pray in the Holy Ghost, light begins to dawn on our path. Revelation begins to dawn on our path. That's what happens. The more we pray in the Spirit, the more violent our faith becomes. Because we build up our faith. Build up ourselves upon our hope, most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now you see, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, what you are doing is just provoking the Spirit of God to show you which way out on that issue. To show you which way out on that issue. Just pray in the Holy Ghost and then you find it. Pray in the Holy Ghost and then you find it. The more you pray in the Holy Ghost, the more violent your faith becomes. Now, let's go to the next one. The next one we're looking at is the testimony wine. Come on, say with me, testimony wine. Testimony wine. And, uh, you know, testimonies can be highly intoxicated. What drove David to confront Goliath was testimony. The Lord who gave me the lion and the bear, he will give me this uncircumcised Philistine today. Don't let go of your testimonies. The Bible says, bind up the testimonies and seal up the law among my disciples. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 16 and verse 20. Bind up the testimonies and seal up the law among my disciples. It's so important to engage your understanding of the testimonies of yesterday in confronting your battles today. In the same vein, the testimony of Jesus among the brethren is a spiritual intoxicant. God has done this for this, that means it's available for me. Is somebody hearing what I'm talking about? Amen. It's time to get out. The ark of testimony has come back to the body of Christ. Yes. The ark of testimony is being restored to the body of Christ. Every testimony of the Lord is prophetic. Yes. Isaiah chapter 9, I mean, Revelation 19 verse 10, he said the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
is a pointer to your inheritance. Every testimony among the brethren is a pointer to your inheritance as yet to be delivered. Listen to this. In Psalm 119, verse 111, he said, Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, and they are the rejoicing of my heart. So every testimony of Jesus is a pointer to your heritage. When you buy into it, it can be very intoxicating. The testimony of Wigglesworth has done a lot in my life. The testimony of Copeland, the testimony of Egan, amazing things. They stir up something in me that it can be done because he did it there, he will do it here. Now, if somebody see here, anyone I'm talking about, this is so important. There is the testimony why. When I sit down in church and people share testimonies, I shed tears. Something is turning on my inside. See God, see God again, see God again, see God again, see God again. So as you hear testimonies and read testimonies from books, open your heart to assess the wine genes in those testimonies. And when you do, it's your turn to get your own. Most people today in the body of Christ have gotten their testimonies from testimonies of others. Why? They came under the influence of those testimonies and that helps them out. Well, to God be praised.